And that is it. I'm going to bring up Talene Monahan. Monah oh, my God. I messed it up, Talene. Talene Monahan. Hi, everyone. Thanks once again to Leah and Gwen and Adam and the amazing staff for having me here. It is such a delight. I want to thank um, these plants who have really been supporting all of us as we've come up and, and done our readings, this lush greenery on the stage. Um, Cool. This lecture will run somewhere between 20 and 50 minutes, I think. <laughs> we'll see. Um, okay. This is a quote from the authors E.B. White and Catherine S. White, written in 1941. Humor can be dissected as a frog can, but the thing dies in the process, and the innards are discouraging to any but the purely scientific mind. So on a related note, here is the description of my lecture that I emailed to Gwen on June 29th. The title is Funny Things in Plays. Is it even possible to speak about this? And the uh, description of the lecture is as follows. The time has come for me to speak on funny things in plays. I like the idea of describing these things and ruminating publicly on why they present as funny within the context of a theatrical journey. I have some concerns about this. For instance, I've never given a lecture and I am concerned by how freely I used the word journey just now. Furthermore, it occurs to me that funny things might be highly subjective. Subjective, yes, but also perplexingly enigmatic and indescribable. Is it possible to describe a funny thing? What if, in trying to describe things that are funny, I strip them of their funny qualities, thereby making them useless slash killing them? As I said, I have my concerns, but I will try, and my plan is to start with Chekhov. I texted that description to my mother a few weeks back, and she texted back, nice, but I wouldn't admit to never giving a lecture before. And then she texted me her Wordle score of the day, which was a really excellent score per usual. I have obviously decided to disregard my mother's advice because being radically transparent about my own inexperience here feels important to the content of this lecture, which is a subjective subject. Funny things are, to some extent, and actually maybe to a massive extent, subjective. This is true even when an audience is roaring with laughter, even when there are many people snorting and guffawing and remarking privately to themselves, oh, this is so funny. I'm so happy I came here to the theater. Laughter really is medicine. I feel healed, rejuvenated. Even then, there's usually at least one person frowning and thinking, these are fools laughing around me. I'm not amused by this, not at all. I wish I was sitting at home and having a snack. And listen, I've sometimes been that person. So it's all subjective, humor is subjective, art is subjective, and as a result, I have no choice here but to speak about things that are funny to me specifically, and there is maybe nothing that's funnier to me than the end of the second act of Anton Chekhov's Uncle Vanya. But we'll get to Vanya in a bit. First, I wanna lay out some definitions. This is a lecture about funny things in theater. I'm going to define a funny thing in the context of this lecture as something that happens on stage that elicits a laugh from the people watching the stage when the thing happens. And I'm going to define laughter as <laughs> the rhythmic contraction of the lungs and the diaphragm, which occurs as a result of a person perceiving a funny thing. Side effects of laughter may include stomach pain and in serious cases, some light involuntary urination. And yet, my main take on laughter is that it feels physically great. And there are apparently really scientific uh, reasons for this. Gelotology is the word for the actual scientific study of laughter. Researchers in the field of gelotology have learned that laughter can improve the function of blood vessels and lower the chances of a heart attack. 
It apparently strengthens our immune systems. Furthermore, a sustained amount of laughter actually qualifies as aerobic exercise, so among other things, it's a great way to get really hot. When a person perceives something funny, a lot of things happen within the brain very quickly. First, the left side of the cortex, which are the cells covering the surface of the forebrain, processes the words. It has just heard. And then the brain's large frontal lobe becomes activated, which is the part that is connected to social and emotional processing. The right side of the cortex does a sort of intellectual analyzing of what has been heard, which then triggers activity spreading backwards to the sensory processing area of the occipital lobe, and the motor sections become stimulated, which causes the person to laugh. Uh, the main reason I share all of this scientific jargon with you is to seem smart. But my other reason for doing so is to emphasize how strange and unique humor processing is from a neurological perspective. The way our brains understand humor is apparently in contrast to the way we process most other emotions, such as grief or anger, which are regulated to only certain parts of the brain, rather than many parts of the brain working in tandem. As a result, if one part of the brain becomes damaged, our sense of humor is very likely to be impacted. The processing of funny things is complicated and precious. When I read about this, about how complicated the act of laughter is neurologically, I thought of a conversation that had influenced me from a few years back in which Gloria Steinem and the late great Bell Hooks spoke, speak about laughter. Obviously, I was not a participant in this conversation, but I watched it on YouTube, and it made me think about laughter and feel excited. In this conversation, Steinem says, laughter is the only free emotion. You can compel fear, you can also compel love if someone is isolated and dependent for long enough. But you cannot force laughter. It happens when two things come together and suddenly make a third, like that. It happens when you learn something. You understand the aha factor. It's like an orgasm of the mind. And if you haven't laughed, you can't pray. We can gauge whether or not we are in the right place by if we are allowed to laugh. In the decade that I've worked as a professional actor, the hardest thing I've been asked to do on stage, hands down, was a scene in which I had to laugh uproariously for several minutes. As a female actor specifically, I'm often asked to cry copiously in stage monologues and SVU auditions. Perhaps because of all the practice I've had at it, I find crying pretty easy and full transparency here, I have some great tricks that I use convincingly to get the waterworks going which is a, you know, a lecture for, for next year at Sewanee, um, probably. But laughing is really different, actually. I literally can't phone it in. Uh, it requires a sort of authenticity that I find artistically terrifying. Back to the YouTube conversation. Bell Hooks responds to Steinem, and she says, fascism likes us to not be funny. If laughter is a sign of self-possession, then white people fear black people when we laugh because we are present to one another. Laughter from slavery to the present day has been one of the ways we articulate our subjectivity. I find it really fascinating to think about laughter both as a radical act of freedom and as an act of subjective self-expression. I like the idea that laughter is fundamentally populist. Even though a sense of humor may and does vary from person to person, a funny thing can strike anyone, is free for anyone to access, which is of course why it can feel so dangerous. So. Laughter comes from funny things, and in plays specifically, I believe that there are two categories of funny things. Obviously, there are jokes, and I'm going to define jokes as funny things that are funny because of the words that are chosen and arranged in a specific order by the playwright. Those are jokes. In this lecture, I'm going to refer to jokes as explicable funny things. They are funny, they utilize known machinery, all the words are working hard at being words for the desired result. The funny thing makes sense, we can explain why it makes sense, and I am gonna speak more on jokes in a bit. But there are other funny things which I think are funny precisely because they express something for which we as a speaking species literally lack the words. And these are what I call inexplicable funny things which brings me to Uncle Vanya, the funniest play ever written for theater. <laughs> Uncle Vanya is a play about an elderly professor, I'm not gonna pronounce the name right, 
Serbryakov, Serbryakov, and his significantly younger, singularly pretty wife, Yelena, who return to their country estate because the professor's health is declining. Serbryakov has a daughter, Sonia, who's not much younger than Yelena, and Yelena and Sonia have historically been weird with each other. But at the end of act two, they decide to move past the weirdness, to make up, to start anew with each other. It's an amazing scene. They embrace, they pour wine, they interlock arms and drink, they kiss each other, they cry together. The stage direction in my script, which is the Annie Baker adaptation reads, they are both excited. They are both excited. <laughs> Uh, there's a complicated thing, however, that's happening, which is that Sonia is desperately in love with Astrov, the handsome doctor. But Astrov is in love with Yelena, who, despite having a lifetime of pretty person privilege, is unhappy and feels trapped in her marriage to Sonia's father. In this Sonia Yelena makeup scene at the end of Act Two, Yelena delivers a long monologue that ends with these lines Me, I'm boring. I'm like a minor character in a play. With my music and this house and all my love affairs, for my whole life, I've always been a minor character. Just between the two of us, Sonia, when I think about it, I'm very, very unhappy. She walks around agitated. Nothing makes me happy. No. Why are you laughing? Sonia's laughing and covering her face, and she says, I don't know. I can't help it. I'm so happy. And that's the first funny thing. But Yelena does not acknowledge the fact that Sonia has just had a psychotic reaction to her confession of unhappiness. Instead, she looks at the piano and she says, I want to play something. I want to play something right now. And Sonia embraces her and says, play. I can't sleep anyways. Play. And then Yelena remembers her sick elderly husband, and she says, wait, your father's still up. When he feels sick, music irritates him. Go ask him if it's all right, and then I'll play. And Sonia says, I'll be right back. Sonia runs off to ask, and Ale Yelena is left alone. She stands thrilled by the idea of expressing the angst of her soul through art, through music. She says out loud, I haven't played in ages. I'll play and I'll cry. I'll play and I'll cry like a fool. And there's a long pause. And then Sonia re-enters. And she says, he said no. And then the act ends. <laughs> um, and this exchange is really funny to me. Uh, <laughs> and now is the scary part where I try to explain why. And I'm a little worried that I actually I can't. <laughs> um, but I'm going to try to, or at the very least, I will try to explain why I can't explain. The end of Act Two of Uncle Vanya is an inexplicable funny thing. Actually, it's maybe several inexplicable funny things which occur in quick succession. When inexplicable funny things occur, there are forces at work within the play that produce something basically indescribable, something that cannot be explained. There are no words to explain fully what has just happened. Even the playwright, the person who's supposed to be the word wizard, does not have the words. And listen, it's not the playwright's fault. It's not, it's not always the playwright's fault. The problem is with words, I think. There are only 171,476 words in the system that many of us use to communicate, which is the English language. There should probably be a lot more words. For instance, I've never found uh, an English word that works as a satisfying translation for a word that I grew up with, and the Armenian word jarbig, which basically means like crafty, but in a good way. And I imagine that all word systems are flawed and faulty. Many words are simply uh, bad at being words. They only partially describe the thing that they are trying to describe. And they have one job, it's describe a thing that's happening. And they can't finish the job. <laughs> uh, think about a word like love, which refers to a constellation of disparate sensations so vast as to make the word confusing and sort of meaningless. I would like it to take a sledgehammer to the word love and watch it splinter into pieces I could christen with new names. 
new words so as to describe each feeling more accurately, but it doesn't work that way. And yes, I do recognize the irony of me standing up here in front of a, a room full of writers uh, employing a form of verbal cannib cannibalism, using words to insult words, turning them on themselves. I get it. But words are finicky, words are lazy, words are imprecise, words often collectively refuse to be arranged in an order which would suitably capture something that is happening out here in this humid corner of the solar system where life is being chaotically lived. And as a result, those of us who are left out here with these things that are happening all around us all the time that we are unable to discuss, I really believe this. But what I also believe is that sometimes these things, the ones that words have failed to uh, precisely illuminate for us, these things appear all of a sudden in plays and they are inexplicable funny things. The methods by which inexplicable funny things find their ways into plays are various. Sometimes they occur because of the skill of the performers who in their behavior reflect something mysterious and recognizable which excites the audience. Sometimes it is because the playwright has been clever and has figured out how to set a trap with words which allows for an inexplicable thing to manifest or replicate itself in front of us with some consistency. Sometimes inexplicable funny things just happen randomly or out of luck. Certain inexplicable funny things sprout up on a single night, never to be seen on that stage again. But when they occur, no matter why or how it has happened, we in the audience see something on stage that we recognize from our own lived experience but don't have the words for. And it's like something has rhymed in our organs or like our souls have been tickled and the result is that we laugh. Or rather, the result is that some of us laugh and some of us sit there and think, no, that's not funny to me. I'm sitting here surrounded by fools. All I can think about is being home and having my snack. Because again, despite all of us having brain matter and fingernails, we are not a monolith. Now, ex explicable funny things operate very differently than inexplicable, in my opinion. Explicable things are very satisfying as a playwright. It's very satisfying to write a joke and understand that the joke is funny because of the words that you have forced into a lineup. Like I imagine it's a similar satisfaction to what a grade school teacher feels after gathering a rowdy crowd of children into a line after recess. Everyone's behaving, behaving, the chaos of recess is over, the class will start on time. It seems to me that explicable funny things are generally funny for three reasons, which are explicable. One, they present something explicitly familiar. Two, they present something sudden or surprising. Three, they are a sort of combo platter that the playwright has served up of a familiar thing with a surprising twist or like a different pattern of familiar and surprising, which I'm gonna get into. I'm gonna give some examples from these categories of explicable things from plays, and then I will try to explain what I think is happening in each one that makes them funny. But before I dive in, I wanna briefly hold space for my anxiety Retelling funny things in this context is totally risky behavior. Employing academic analysis, employing lectern acting, taking funny things and lifting them out of the glass case of the plays in which they live so that we may look at them more closely. The fact is that some funny things may just not look the same outside of their glass case. They may become distorted or they may fall and break because of me, <laughs> because I'm <laughs> doing a bad job of presenting them, uh, and I might imperil the funniness of the, fu of the very things I'm trying to elevate for you. So the stakes are really high, um, but keeping that in mind, the first category of, explic of explicable funny things are funny things which employ the familiar. I think of these as jokes which explicitly use a word or several words that is familiar to the audience. Something familiar is spoken on stage, and as a result, the people watching begin to blare like a metal detector that has stumbled onto some sort of silvery treasure. Apparently there's something very funny about detection. Uh, I tried to do this to uh, employ this type of joke to like a really lame extent earlier in the speech, talking about my mother's Wordle score. It's mixed effect. But I experienced a more effective version of this, of a familiar explicable th thing last week, uh, I guess two weeks ago now, at 
Williamstown Theater Festival where I was acting in a reading of a new play called God Save the Queer by Zachary Grady. Zach's play imagines the current royal children, George, Charlotte, and Louis, all grown up in 2047. In the future world, George is now gay and has just married a man, and the three royals fight over the succession of the monarchy as ominous smog presses in on the palace walls. In the middle of a tirade about a massive palace snafu, Charlotte says to George, on the week of your wedding, we had to allocate funds because you demanded we pay Adele to come out of retirement and sing at the ceremony. And George responds, yes, and because of it, she's now recording 55, so everyone's welcome. Zach added this joke the day before the reading and was surprised at how well it did with a live audience. The element of double familiarity present in both the Adele name check reference and the knowledge of how she names her albums with her current age was really delightful. I want to mention uh, that the, uh, with explicable funny things that traffic in familiarity, there is an element not just of recognition but of ego on the part of the audience. More, uh, more so than with other funny things, jokes based in the familiar allow audiences to feel that their personal knowledge is being rewarded, that they are part of an insi sort of inside joke. A version of this is what I'll call superiority jokes which take familiarity a step further and reward not just the audience's knowledge, but the superiority of their knowledge as it relates to the characters on stage. In Gogol's The Government Inspector, Kolestikov, a narcissistic fop, is mistaken for a government inspector by the residents of a corrupt rural town in Russia. In Jeffrey Hatcher's wonderful adaptation of the text, Kolestikov is bragging to the mayor's wife Anna Andreevna about his vast literary career, which is, which is fake, he's made it up. And Anna Andreevna explain, exclaims, would we have read anything of yours? And Telestikov said, well, see, I don't write under my own name, nom de plume. And Anna gasps and says, your nom de plume? Nom de plume is my favorite writer. <laughs> um, the explicable funny thing here, of course, is that we are familiar with what nom de plume means, and so we feel superior to Anna Andreevna. We feel good about having more knowledge than she does. This is a very common type of funny thing. And I, I wonder why. I wonder about uh, what is going on in our brains as our cortexes and frontal lobes pulse and trade the information back and forth until we laugh at the person on stage who has less knowledge than we do. Does this sort of funny thing appeal to our meanness? <laughs> um, is it funny to see someone who's dumb or ignorant? Maybe. <laughs> um, or, or perhaps the laughter is actually a manifestation of relief. Relief that we have learned something in our time as sentient flesh forms. And so witnessing this person's relative lack of knowledge is proof that our own knowledge accumulation system has worked out pretty well proof that we are out here doing okay. What a relief. Let's laugh. The next type of explicable funny thing is one that's based in surprise. The humor comes from the opposite of familiarity. It comes from the audience literally not anticipating what has just been said or what has just happened. They are shocked and it can be funny to be shocked. In Lunch Bunch by our very own Sarah Einspanier, two public defenders are in the midst of a private and somewhat vulnerable conversation in their office. One of them confides in the other. She says, I'm having that feeling you get when you have an email waiting. I can't tell if it's bad or good. Maybe it's boring. I can feel my heart beating, ba-bum, ba-bum, ba-boom, inside my chest. Do you ever feel like there's no time? And suddenly, a character whom we didn't even realize was on stage pops his face out and exclaims, there's time, I think we just waste most of it. The shock of Greg's assertive interjection in the midst of Tuttle's moment of vulnerability is very funny. In, uh, more often than not, though, explicable funny things slash jokes actually employ a bait-and-switch pattern of familiar and surprising. In Jocelyn Bio's comedic masterpiece, Schoolgirls, or the African Mean Girls play, she employs this in, this in an exchange between two schoolgirls in Ghana in 1986. In this exchange, Paulina, the ringleader of the girls, is bragging about her family connections to America. 
She says, well, you know my Auntie Sala works at that high-class restaurant I was telling you about. And the girls get very excited, and they respond, ah, yes, White Castle, a castle with food. <laughs> the White Castle bit packs a triple punch. There's the familiarity of White Castle, the superiority jolt of knowing more than the characters do about White Castle, and the surprise punch of a hilariously literal and inaccurate interpretation of the reference. So that would be familiar, familiar, surprise. Sometimes a funny thing that combines the familiar with the surprising can be crafted as a thing that builds throughout the play. I'm going to be gross and use an example from a play that I've written. Um, my play, Jane Inger, is about William Shakespeare stuck in quarantine in 1606, suffering from writer's block. In the play, Shakespeare is the same prodigious talent that we all know, but he's also narcissistic, abusive, and tempestuous. He's annoyed that the plague has broken out because of the public pressure he feels to write his next masterpiece during plague times. Furthermore, he's frustrated that he's been forced into quarantine because he wants people to see his new cool earring. He said, oh, I just got this cool earring. Later, Jane Inger, a cunning woman in Shakespeare's erstwhile dark lady, climbs in through the window to his apartment. Shakespeare is excited to see her, and he exclaims, Janie, I was worried that you were dead in a mud ditch somewhere and would never see my cool earring. Jane doesn't respond, and a few lines later, Shakespeare brings up the earring again in a speech in which he's trash-talking his wife, Anne Hathaway. He says, Yes, I long ago determined it very natural that I should spend the entirety of our marriage apart from Anne Hathaway. It was impossible to remain in Stratford, given the demands of my writing and my robust pansexuality. You did see my cool earring, right, Janie? Still, he gets no response. Not long after that, Anne Hathaway herself climbs through the window of the quarantine department. She is exuberant and desperate to see her husband, who hasn't vid visited her in Stratford for seven years. She sees Shakespeare and exclaims, William, oh, I see you have a cool earring now. And Shakespeare sighs and shakes his head and says, she ruined it. <laughs> so to explain what I was trying to do there with the cool earring bit, uh, I was initially taking something loosely familiar, familiar to some people, which is this idea that Shakespeare maybe wore a, a small hoop earring uh, an image which has become affixed to our image of him because of a painting that is dubiously assumed to represent him. That's where that comes from. So I took this like sort of familiar thing, and then I worked to make it even more familiar to the audience through the use of repetition. I kept on repeating it, trying to make it more and more familiar. And then I added a little surprise by stripping the familiar thing, this idea that Shakespeare is invested in his earring being cool, of its power to the character. So the structure of that bit here would be familiar, 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 surprise. What about physical comedy <laughs> in plays? I'll define physical comedy as a funny thing that happens on a stage that is funny because of something that a performer is doing with their voice or body. I would maybe also define it sometimes as like, sometimes I feel like something could happen with like the set or a costume that is also physical comedy. It's something sort of material on stage. Um, but it's the best. <laughs> physical comedy is the best. The times I've laughed the hardest in the theater see serious side effects of laughter have been almost exclusively due to some form of physical comedy. Perhaps it feels belabored to employ the binary here, but I'm going to maintain that funny things manifested in physical comedy can also be divided into the explicable and the inexplicable. A common explicable form of physical comedy is derived from taking a familiar thing and heightening it. This frequently comes in the form of a depiction of a person in an altered or heightened state. Drugs and alcohol are pretty familiar, explainable things. Most of us have either experienced their dizzying effects or seen others distorted by them. And I think maybe it's funny to watch their presence manifested on stage because intoxicated people robustly embody our familiar and often baser impulses without the cover of propriety. You, you know all that. <laughs> um, some physical comedy that I've really enjoyed. In the last Broadway revival of You Can't Take It With You, the actress Julie Halston performed an iconic bit of physical comedy, playing a woman who has imbibed an almost lethal amount of gin and uh, needs to get upstairs. The set in this production was centered by a magnificent staircase, and Halston crawled up the entire staircase on her knees at a snail's pace, clutching and careening in a gin-induced haze, 
with the audience and some of the cast on stage losing their minds. I was similarly undone watching Rachel Dratch's performance in the recent Broadway production of Selena Fillinger's POTUS. In this play, Dratch starred as the overworked White House press secretary who accidentally ingests a cocktail of hallucin hallucinogenic drugs at the very moment that pandemoni pandemonium has broken out in the administration. For me, the highlight of the production was watching Dratch dashing around the White House psychotically, at some point wearing a flotation device at another draped in the American flag and covered in blood. <laughs> it was really funny. And it's familiar, right? This drugs, alcohol heightened familiar sensations. Explicable familiar physical comedy also frequently utilizes surprise. I'm gonna circle back to Jane Inger. I'm gonna spoil a major plot point uh, right now, <laughs> which is that towards the end of the play, after Shakespeare has done several unforgivable and tyrannical things, Anne Hathaway grabs a rapier and suddenly cuts off one of his arms. And he, explain, he exclaims, Anne, that was my arm, ow! And then Jane Inger lunges at him and cuts off the other arm. Shakespeare now has uh, no arms, just two blood spurting stumps. In this case, the blunt shock, literally, of seeing a person lose two arms with no warning qualifies as a surprising explicable, explicable thing. <laughs> the funny thing is amplified in this moment by Shakespeare's responding to the severing of his limbs in the same way that a bratty child might respond to a paper cut, which is like a very Monty Python sort of, uh, thing. Uh, so the structure there would be surprise, surprise, familiar. But what about the inexplicable? What about all those moments in plays of which I have spent most of this lecture trying to avoid speaking? Inexplicable funny things are basically like they're the definition of you had to be there. So, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead anyways and I'm going to give some examples of uh, physical performances and plays that have really made me laugh. Uh, when Jacob Ming Trent entered on stage in the revival of The Alchemist this past fall in, uh, at Red Bull Theater, he was wearing a cape. There was a look on his face. You had to be there. Um, <laughs> what Midori Francis did uh, with a stuffed animal in Ming Pfeiffer's Usual Girls. I can't recreate it for you. You had to be there. Just two weeks ago, I saw a stage reading at New York Stage and Film in which Maki Borden pretended to be a cat for about 30 seconds, and he really seemed like a cat. And it made me laugh so hard that the sunglasses on my hat flew off my head and landed a few rows behind me. But I can't, I can't explain more because you had to be there. <laughs> so I think maybe it is these funny things, the ones that prove verbally elusive, that best distinguish theater from other literary forms that use words. After all, plays are not funny in a box. They're usually not funny in the windowless rehearsal rooms where they're being made. True funny things cannot be born until there are people there to laugh, to recognize the thing that's happening and to participate, to bear witness, to make a cacophonous score with their mouth sounds. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the dominant history of stage hum humor derived from racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, xenophobia, traditional comedy, and certainly traditional farce in the American theater has long been the realm of the straight white man, and with it, the proliferation of jokes, mostly superiority jokes, at the expense of oppressed peoples. Whom we allow to make funny things on the stage is as vital as whom we allow to come watch them, whom we invite to laugh. A few years ago, working as an actor, I was asked to wear a padded bra to help make a funny thing happen more effectively on stage. What was happening in the play, in this scene, in this line, uh, was that a male character was alluding vaguely to the voluptuous figure of uh, the character that I was playing, which obviously didn't land. Um, and <laughs> diving deeper and employing like structural analysis here, I would categorize this funny thing as explicable familiar. The idea was that the audience would recognize that a character was talking about boobs, and then they would recognize physical boobs, and then they would laugh. So the structure of the joke would be familiar, familiar. But it wasn't working in performances, and so that's why a padded bra was suggested. Maybe the funny thing would work better if my breasts were bigger. If I stuck my chest out more explicitly while the line was being delivered, maybe then we would get a laugh. 
We never found out because I said no to the padded bra. I think that some funny things are not worth the dream of a laugh. As Steinem and Hooks observed, laughter can be a sort of armament in the arsenal of protest, something that affirms our own sense of self or connects our sense of self to others around us. Laughter can be immensely fortifying, and this can sometimes manifest in a very private and personal way as well. When we laugh and when we don't laugh is part of our power and our personhood, even when we're the only one who doesn't find something funny, but also even when we are the only person who does, which makes me think about Uncle Vanya again, of course. I, I didn't do a great job explaining what is so funny about two unhappy women being denied the pleasure of playing piano. And I think it's very possible that many people, may, maybe most people, do not find this scene as funny as I do. Perhaps I'm the only person in the audience who's laughing. Perhaps everyone else is looking up at me and thinking, why is she laughing? These women's lives are tragic. I personally feel torn up inside because they can't play piano. There's nothing funny about this. I just want to watch this play in peace and then go home and eat my snack. And I wish I, I wish I could explain better. Maybe I am amused by tragedy. Maybe I like seeing people get excited only to be let down. Maybe the scene reminds me of the times I have been unhappy and restless and bored, but also in love, but also mortified by being in love, uh, but also artistically invigorated by feeling like I'm in love, writing bad erotic poems in the notes app on my phone, talking to myself even as I pretend <laughs> that I'm talking to other people. The Uncle Vanya scene reminds me of that kind of feeling or the chaos of those many feelings scrambled together in a way that is hard to explain. But it's funny to think that a fake woman in Russia felt that way over 100 years ago. It's funny to me to think that this in inexplicable messiness did not begin with me. Thank you.